This class is focused on poverty. This is the main goal. And we study poverty at two levels. We study environmental issues, specifically issues of water and sanitation. And secondly, we study these issues in the larger context of increasing inequality in the world. So this is a design class, yet the main goal of this class is not to design an object. Uh, the goal is to uh, precisely reflect upon the politics of design and the politics of commodities. And in particular, uh, I'm very interested in us to reflect about the politics of commodities when it comes to sanitation. And possibly the closest that you can get to a non-commodity sanitation solution is this. Because this thing is very common in, say, rural areas of the third world, because things like oil, paint, detergent, even flour, this is how they are transported in these buckets. So you often find, and I'll show you a video later, when before a workshop on sanitation in a very distant indigenous community in Guyana, in the South American Caribbean, I just show up without a bucket because that was part of the experiment. And we got one, even there, which is a very distant place. Anywhere, probably yeah. you have one of these at home. We got this yesterday for 300 Guyana dollars, and this is the perfect one. So you can definitely um, find, recycle, or reuse buckets, and then repurpose them as a very decent toilet. That uh, brings back the comfort of the city, the, 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 the green, the seat. Going back to your previous presentations, uh, about uh, competition, what are you competing against? And you are not, you don't want to make people change the habits and what we have been used to for more than 100 years to this comfort. Now, how does a non commodity fit within the context of a sanitation program uh, within the bigger project of development? Organizations work especially in the developing world. So the target is this. This would be a non-commodity in a rural area, and this is, again, we are talking about Guyana here. Everything you can find. It. The natural resources, in the case of this big toilet, just palm leaves, and even some recycled and found material like plastics. Here is another view. And you can use also all the metal sheets. Now, this is an old and important character in the tale of development. Is the pit toilet. And the, the pit toilet is the target in many development programs that deal with sanitation. This is what we don't want. This is what we want them not to use anymore. And this is why we normally involve the commodity. Let's buy one of those huge toilets, huge composting toilets. Um, so that's, that's more or less the, 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 the mindset of the development worker. So the first touch is flush toilets, but providing sewage for flush toilets in distant areas is just too expensive, it's impossible. So a second thought that is becoming very popular is composting toilets, because with composting toilets, you make the investment in the object, in the commodity, but you don't have to make the investment in the sewage system and the sewage system is what's most expensive, but it also goes buried, so there is a, that's an expense that nobody sees. So the political cost of building sewage is too problematic because there is money invested there, billions of dollars, but nobody sees it. 
because it's underneath. Now, why is this so important? Why are we talking about cities? Uh, why are, aren't we talking about cities? Because those 2.3 billion without sanitation, most of them concentrate in these areas. It is in rural areas where, where uh, poverty is more critical today. And within those rural areas is among indigenous people. Consistently, in rankings of poverty in countries overall, indigenous people are some of the lowest, some of the poorest people today. However, this little device is very appreciated, as you will see it in the video, uh, because people just can build it with the resources they have, and oftentimes the uh, resource they have to invest is their own time, their own labor, and they have that. So there is that cash involved. And the cash is where things get complicated. If I need cash to do something like this, this is not going to happen. Because if I have little cash, I will use it to buy my food. And even you can reuse the outhouse sometimes. You just move it once the pig gets full. But the pig toilet does have some limitations. Uh, there are places where it doesn't uh, work, and we discussed in a previous class a place uh, in, the, in the plains in South America where this man was digging a pit, and soon after, if it rained, the pit collapsed, and he had to dig and dig. And dig. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, so all those are pits that you have dug yeah. and the toilet sinks in, yeah. the, the building sunk, sinks in. Yeah. Why does that happen? Mm -hmm. This one is just the, um, when the water flow down on the, this mud. Cave in. Caves in. Yeah. Oh, okay, and that happens every rainy season. Every rainy season. So that means you have been moving the toilet no. for nine years? Yes. We have talked about also uh, places where you cannot build a pit toilet because there's not enough space. So this is land. These people own their own land. They can build many pit toilets wherever they want. But if you're living in a slum, for example, in a very urban area, you won't be able to be a building one pit toilet for you. So there will be one for 300, 400 families, for example. And that poses other series of problems that include, they go all the way from health to uh, security issues. And we have talked about that. Uh, what women, for example, have to go through when they have to use this community infrastructure, precarious infrastructure in the middle of the night. And another issue is that, and this is one of the charges that development workers make, uh, that pit toilets contaminate freshwater sources. And that's an, an argument that you have to actually be taken with a grain of salt because it's not only that that is contaminating freshwater sources. Also, animal excreta, for example, contaminates water sources or fuels. So, it, shutting the pits is not going to end the problem. So probably there is an overreaction sometimes to the pit. There are some people who do believe in the pit, and we know um, the programs that try to make, come up with a mix between a pit and a composting toilet, and that's what originally more or less the VIP toilet was, and we have also studied the VIP toilet. In any case, the issue of water is what has prompted historically the development of uh, the composting toilet as a commercial alternative. Uh, you know that. It's a popular alternative now. So we studied A to D out of a list of 15, and we didn't study today others because we had the, uh, studied them before. We studied the Clevos, we studied the, the Phoenix, and you show once in the past a series of small portable alternatives. So we have talked in class, only in class, we have talked uh, about around 20 
different models of composting toilets that are industrially uh, produced and uh, most of them are available in the market. There could be about 40 uh, uh, today. Yet another pattern that we saw today is that the majority of these alternatives target a very specific demographic. This is upper class, educated people who are going to use these little commodities for their vacation homes and they are very expensive. Um, so added to that, they are very big, they are technological complicated, so very few of these toilets would be feasible to implement. When you are dealing with issues of scale, for example, of providing sanitation for a village of 2,000 people, you cannot be buying toilets that are $2,000 or $3,000 each. And you cannot be buying toilets that are so expensive and that need so many instructions and so many uh, little things and that would need somebody to service the toilet if things don't work. And you cannot deal with that and you cannot afford that, especially because you don't know who's going to be using the toilet. People might not be as interested as you are in following the process uh, to make sure that the toilet is there. And something that I experimented in the past, very early when I became interested in this issue, was that it didn't matter how many workshops you held, many people would just go there and go. And then you would have a huge tank full of that there. And that doesn't compost. So the consumer base of a commercial composting toilet is restricted. This is for educated people, people who are very aware of what they want to do, families who are into the green thing because that tells your culture and your sophistication, right? Today, those who are most eco-sensitive are also those who are most educated and who are wealthier. Because otherwise, how can you get your weekly uh, groceries at Whole Foods? You have to have some money, right? Um, so the question remains, if we think about an alternative for this, is there a feasible composting alternative? Is there a feasible dry to toilet alternative? If there is one, feasible dry toilet alternative for those 2.3 billion people without sanitation in the world? And what would the alternative be like? So this is a difficult question and uh, uh, we don't know. We don't know. There is not the solution yet speaking about uh, composting toilets for the poor, so to speak. But I have come with, uh, up with some principles that I think would form the basis of what the alternative would be like and these are principles that I have a right to uh, on the basis of a few years of experience in the field of working in development. So the first thing is this would be a commodity. It can be made out of reused materials and it is not that if you can buy it, you can have it. As it happens with commercial alternatives. The second thing is that it should focus on the process, not on the product. And we talk about this. Is the compost, not the composter. If you follow the logic of the composting system, you don't need any complicated machine. And something as simple as a bucket will do it. The third thing is very critical for this type of pro uh, product is not an imposition. You just suggest it. You just inform it and you go. You cannot be getting so much into the people's life as telling them this is your toilet and you have to use it. This should be just a by the way. You share it and people will decide if they want to take it or if they want to continue with the other systems. So you're going to see it in the video that I'm going to show uh, later uh, that my attitude is almost praising this and saying, yes, your solution works. The other thing is that even if you know that those 
solutions in place don't work, probably what you identify as a very serious problem is not a problem for the user, for the local user. So if for us, for me, the smell is a horrible thing and you shouldn't afford to be proposing toilets that smell, and I always say, if the composting toilet smell is not working, you have to fix something. People can perfectly say, it smells horrible, and not identify that as a problem. Any they problem, can anybody? Leave. Any problem? No. 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 So you're happy with this one? Yeah. Yeah. What about the smell? Ugly. Ugly. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is, it should be simple. You, sh you shouldn't be digging, you know, through the internet trying to find a, a manual for how you use it. So I always talk about five points, five points. What are the points? Uh, variety. Variety? Uh, balance between nitrogen and uh, carbon, oxygen, temperature, moisture. Moisture. So those five that you can memorize, and then we say in the end all those five get reduced to maybe five, uh, maybe two, which is keep it oxygenated and keep it uh, keep the moisture, keep it covered. and uh, not necessarily because if you keep it uh, keep it covered with carbon material, not 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 with this, you don't need this, okay. But even if you do this, it could trap some oxygen. So in the end, uh, all you need to do is to make sure, as you just say, keep it covered, like a cat. Just do it and then cover it, just like a cat, until you don't see it anymore. Your and the fifth uh, point is, it's fun, it's entertaining. Comment. Talk about it with him or don't take that to see him. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. So you have this, don't get too and when you are too done, crazy, too you cover it. passionate about it. And the sixth thing is you try it yourself, which is something that many people in the business of environmental development don't do. You show up at workshops and other community programs saying what do you do, what do you should do, what this and this and that, and you never see and do it. So if you are proposing crazy environmental things that make too much sense, just do it yourself. If you are proposing for people to live in uh, containers, there are so many programs, uh, projects in architecture, beautiful architectural projects, containers. Those containers that are used to export and import stuff, so you recycle and make them into beautiful houses for the people. Do you live in a container? Would you live in a container? So that's the first thing. So if you're talking about this, would you in one of these things? Now, one alternative that I have found that fit, uh, uh, fulfills those requirements is not a commodity, focuses on the process, is not an imposition, is simple, is fun, and you try it first, is the bucket. Uh, it's cheap or it's free and another interesting thing is that the bucket can be made as sophisticated as you want and become part of a, a composting system or even a building so let me show you a couple of projects that I did in the past you can be that sophisticated with a bucket but you can just use a bucket also there is the possibility to do something as simple as a pile so you use it, it is full, just empty it and go back whenever there is no other option. And that has its own set of problems. People would argue, well, if you are doing that, you are contaminating water sources, for example. But if that's an option to the pit toilet, with the pit toilet you are doing the same. So when you have a pile, what you have different than the pit toilet is that the pile will compost and you can reuse it as an agricultural uh, uh, resource. And that will, have, that will be perfect for places like desertic areas where there is not enough, enough fertile uh, soil. Yet the most immediate goal with this toilet is emergency situations. 
when you don't have any other option because there is a flood. And what I'm going to show you now uh, came from the necessity to share this idea with villagers uh, in a place uh, where uh, uh, in the same country there had been a situation, a very dramatic situation, where there was a big flood, an expected flood. People were using pit toilets, but they were also using wells. So the water from the flood came into the pit, got all that out, and deposited in the wells where they were getting their uh, fresh water. And the situation was so absolutely dramatic that the government had no other option than sending hundreds of uh, bottles with bottled water. An extremely unsustainable solution, but it was an emergency solution. So the intention with this, the quick workshops were to tell people, listen, when you are in that situation, uh, in order to not contaminate the water, or if, if you, you know, outside of the house there are three feet of water and you don't know where to go, this is a good option. And this becomes very relevant, very relevant, not only in the third world, not anymore, when we know that crazy weather situations are also affecting places as close to us as New York. And the New York Times was reporting during a hurricane that people were having trouble with their toilets because there was no water to flush the toilets, the, flush, the toilets were stinking and there was no drinking water. So I always say, and I have said it before, you have no water access, the water is interrupted because of something, the least thing you want to do is to use the water that you have in the, in the tank to flush once and then you have the same problem. So what you do is get, a, get even a plastic bag, it's an emergency, get some dry stuff, it can be paper, and start doing it there. Okay? And then use that water to drink it. Something that I want to give you is, I also a hand out a one page a graphic handout to all the attendants with the five steps so they they remember easily. One thing that I noticed that I thought was fantastic was that after two years or something that I held one of these workshops, I visited Park, a, a village, and I was talking to this man a bit there and he opened uh, a, a notebook and he had the handout. So I thought this is important because the goal, and I often say it in the workshops, you don't need it now. But at some point, the hope is that you will remember, oh, there was a crazy man here explaining how to use this type of toilet when we uh, are in a situation in which we need it. Again, this brings us uh, to the issue of sustainability. When do we want to be sustainable? Uh, when the environmental consciousness of people awakens, it just happens when you need the thing. And it happened in the first world when, in the first world, people started to need the thing. So the environmental awareness in the United States, for example, greatly grew after Katrina. And the environmental movement in the United States is not the same as it was before 2005. Now it's mainstream. Is there any other question? Um, did you ever explore this in your idea of the folding? We did that uh, in, uh, in Ecuador, in San Lorenzo. Um, that was as far as I went. I started becoming more and more frustrated with the with uh, complex objects. The more complex, the least it works, and uh, we didn't have the chance to see that one uh, working. I did uh, see that there were some leakings. The last time I visited that project, we finished it in the 1990s. Then there was again one more social issue. There was a big land invasion. And those were, that was land that belonged to a Australian organization. People just took over. And 
these were permaculture gardens, uh, very nice uh, housing structure that I had designed as a volunteer for that organization. All that was reclaimed by villagers and they built housing, which I think is a, a, a very interesting outcome. And again, one more lesson that you cannot be thinking about environmental problems, especially in impoverished areas, as uh, disconnected from social uh, problems. There was nothing the people who were there in that uh, eco project they could do when the invasion came. They had to leave. Uh, so no, no, I'm not trying objects anymore, and this is what I do. I now I am fully centered on processes, and I forgot about about the science.